Thank you, honorable members. Before we proceed, I would like to remind you that the virtual mini plenary is deemed to be in the precincts of parliament, and it does constitute a meeting of the National Assembly for debating purposes only. In addition to the rules of virtual sittings, the rules of the National Assembly, including the rules of debate apply. Members enjoy the same powers and privileges that apply in the sitting of the National Assembly. Members should equally note that anything said in the virtual platform is deemed to have been said to the House and may be ruled upon. All members who have locked in shall be considered present and are requested to mute their microphones and only unmute when recognized to speak. The microphones are very sensitive and will pick up noises which may disturb other members. And when requested to speak, please unmute your microphone and connect your video. However, we are going to go into a load shedding schedule very soon. So if you find out that your connectivity is unstable when you're about to speak, please disconnect your video and continue speaking on the microphone only. Members may make use of the icons on the bar at the bottom of the screens, which has an option that allows a member to put up his or her hand to raise a point of order. The Secretariat will assist me in this regard. When using the virtual platform, members are urged to refrain or desist from unnecessary points of order or interjections. We shall now proceed to the order, which is debate on vote number three and 15, Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs Appropriation Bill. I now recognize the Honorable Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs. The Honorable Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson or Speaker, Chairperson of the National House of Traditional and Khoisan Leaders, Honorable Ministers and Deputy Ministers, Deputy Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, Mr. Obed Babela and Ms. Tembisi Lenka Dimeng, Honorable Chairperson and members of the Portfolio Committee, Honorable Members, Chairperson of the Commission for the Promotion and Protection of the Rights of Cultural, Religious and Linguistic Communities, Chairperson of the Municipal Demarcation Board and its members, President of the South African Local Government Association, Deputy Chairperson of the IEC, members of the Provincial Executive Committees, Directors General, DCOC and DTA, CEO of MISA, ladies and gentlemen, and compatriots. Thank you for this opportunity to present the budget votes 3 and 15 in honor of the millions of women and men who sacrificed so that we may realize a better life for all. On the 10th of May, we marked 28 years since the first democratically elected president made his inaugural address. On that occasion, President Mandela reminded us that, I quote, out of the experience of an extraordinary human disaster, that lasted for too long, a society of which humanity will be proud of was born. The recent floods robbed South Africa of 448 people. It has also destroyed over 6,500 houses and partially destroyed over 10,000 houses. As we speak, in case at an alone, more than 7,000 people are housed in 91 shelters. We wish to extend our condolences to those who have lost their loved ones, who also offer our sympathy to those whose loved ones are still missing. We will not rest until each and every one is re rescued or re accounted for. The floods also caused untold damages to schools, hospitals, clinics, roads, bridges, and places of business, which we are still quantifying. We intend to rehabilitate and reconstruct all the damaged infrastructure so that we risk proof 
it as we build back better. We also have been warmed by this empathy and solidarity displayed by millions of South Africans who have individually and collectively contributed to the 129,000 affected residents. We have also received support from the non-governmental -organi non organization and private sector, as well as the diplomatic core from the continent and beyond. We would have loved to mention all of them by name, but due to time constraints, we are unable to do so. Kotwage City, Nangams, Nize Nenze Ganja Alu these disasters and calamities have worsened the situation in relation to challenges of hunger, poverty, unemployment, and inequality. They also contributed to further depressing our economy. According to Stats SA, over 55% of South Africans live below the upper poverty line, and 25% are experiencing food hunger. Unemployment continues to rise, recording 35.5%, which is the highest over the past 15 years. Youth unemployment at over 70% continues unabated. Inequality also continues to increase, with the OECD telling us that the poorest 20% of our households and only 1.7% of the total income. Thus, we must heed to the advice of scientists, which tell us that in future, the eastern parts of our country are bound to experience wetter conditions. This means that those parts will be more prone to floods. On the other hand, the western parts will be drier, meaning that they will be more prone to droughts. We must therefore plan appropriately. But in addition to these floods, we have had uh, floods last year with Cyclone Eloise and also the COVID pandemic, and together they've actually worsened our situation in this country. Honorable Speaker, in addressing the effects of disasters in the past financial year, we allocated 157 million from the Municipal Disaster Relief Grant to address the aftermath of Tropical Storm Eloise in the affected municipalities. The storms were accompanied by summer season rains, which led to the displacement of 3,200 poor people in Bumalanga, KZN, Northwest, and Limpopo. We also allocated 221 million to deal with the crippling effects of the protracted droughts in the Western Cape and Eastern Cape. These resources complemented the efforts of the provinces and municipalities to secure livestock, feed, and improve water supply. Honorable Speaker, infrastructure and its maintenance play a major part in building the resilience of communities. We must turn them into climate smart communities which care for the environment and do not build in dangerous ways or places. This requires supporting municipalities whilst facilitating for the ramp ramping up of the capabilities and capacities of municipalities. As part of the municipal support and intervention package, during the past financial year, 50 civil engineers, 
15 electric engineers, 15 town planners, nine assistant provincial managers, and nine uh, provincial managers from MISA were deployed to various provinces across the country. These professionals are supporting various infrastructure projects and are supported by the 519 municipal officials who were trained by MISA in the past financial year in infrastructure management. Additionally, a total of 382 young people were supported through technical skills apprenticeship, learnership, graduate programs, and bursaries. This is complemented by assisting some 100 young graduates in practical experience so that they may complete their professional registration process. This is our contribution towards functional municipalities that promote the growth of our local economies. In further stimulating local economies, MISA has also trained 2,800 municipal officials in labor-intensive construction methods through the 50 million allocated by the Presidential Employment Stimulus Program. Going forward, the Department of Cooperative Governance through MISA will accelerate support to municipalities that struggle in implementation. Such support will include the 50.6 billion allocated through the Municipal Infrastructure Grant over the MTSF. The grant will support municipalities in delivering basic services like roads, social infrastructure for poor households in 218 municipalities. 10% of this allocation is directed at fulfilling the gap as it relates to repairs and maintenance. And an additional 5% will address infrastructure asset management planning. This we did because a lot of these municipalities were not budgeting for repairs and maintenance. We remain concerned that 39 of our municipalities continue to spend below 70% benchmark in the third quarter. It is also alarming that 30% of these municipalities are water service authorities, meaning that in the communities, the quality and reliability of water and service continue to be a concern. The implementation of DDM will, in implementing the DDM will work with MISA and the Department of Water Affairs to support these 39 municipalities. We have also prioritized the availing of capacities through the district development hubs to the municipalities that are water service authorities. For us, water is survival, it's a survival issue which is second only to oxygen. Of course, sanitation is dignity. We cannot allow our people as to be aspirations to be deemed by the challenge of water. Honorable speaker, whereas we have recorded progress in the implementation of the district development model and the one plans, we're finding that the plans must go through a quality assurance process. We've also found that the current intergovernmental framework architect may not be entirely adequate to facilitate the one plan and one budget. We revised the IGRFA regulations to enable better joint planning. The proposed revisions are currently in front of the state law advisor after months of intensive and extensive consultations. As part of the DTM, we are also jointly hosting the post sona presidential Izimbizo, with the next leg being at the end of the week in Pumalanga. We will also accelerate the implementation of the Eastern Seaboard development through the interdepartmental and multi-sphere project teams. Key projects, including the outstanding land audits, the inter created master plan and the ongoing N2 projects. We have also recently received assurance 
that Sunral will take over the repairs of the very dangerous and unmaintained R61 between Port St. John's and Port Edwards. We've also received interest from local and international investors. We've also finalized all consultation processes relating to the declaring parts of the Eastern Seaboard as a region. Of course, the Eastern Seaboard straddles two provinces and four districts. So it's, it was important, it's important that it should be declared a, a region for development purposes. The Minister of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development in line with the National Special Development Framework, SPLUMA, has agreed to urgently gazette the declaration of relevant areas. This will be supported by a special purpose vehicle which will drive development in that area. Honorable Speaker, our existing cities, towns, and development landscapes also require focused attention. Thus, as part of Integrated Urban Development Fund, Intermediate City Municipality Support Program will accelerate rollout of eight intermediate city municipalities. This will complement the work we are undertaking under the Smart City framework, which the Deputy Minister will elaborate on. Suffice to say, these frameworks and plans must be supplemented by practical projects, which can bring about quality jobs and livelihoods in the short term. One such program is the Innovative Waste Management Program, which has employed 7,444 participants in two provinces since inception in December 2021. The participants are currently engaging in solid waste management activities, such as street cleaning, litter picking, and management of illegal dumping. In this financial year, we intend creating 8,238 additional jobs in this area. This will be complemented by the revised community works program. Honorable speaker, we will continue to monitor and implement actions which are directed at addressing the issues of the issues that were raised by the Auditor General in her report. This we shall do through the forum we have established, which includes the National Treasury, the South African Local Government Association, SALGA, the Auditor General, and the provincial departments responsible for local government and finances, bringing the necessary skills capabilities and capacities to a local level are an important lever by which we can address the issues raised by the AG. We are also paying special attention to the Mangaou Metro, as well as Inokimkijima and Ligwa, local municipalities, under Section 139.7 of the Constitution, which was invoked in Mangaou Metro in March 2020. This was after the section 1395 invoked by the province in the Metro in December, 2020, did not bear fruit. Consequently, a team of interdepartmental experts has been dispatched to Mangawu. These come from the Department of Cocta, Human Settlement, Transport, Treasury, Water Sanitation and MISA. The team and work streams are expected to turn around the dire financial status of the Metro, address the duly escalating political challenges while addressing the governance and administrative challenges, which include consequence management. Enoch, Nkijima, and Ligwa have been identified as financially distressed and are challenged by governance and political issues. Following the court orders against the provincial cocktails, we have placed the municipalities under Section 1397, working with treasure. Honorable members, since our last budget was presented to this house, we welcome the president assenting to the local 
Government Municipal Structures Amendment Act, which came into operation on the 1st of November, 2021. Amongst others, it brings into being an enforceable revised code of conduct for councillors. This amendment provides for the MEC to remove a councillor from office for a breach of the code of conduct. The amendment also introduces a section 79A of the Structures Act, which prohibits municipal office bearers such as mayors and members of ESCO and MECO from being members of the Municipal Public Accounts Committee, MPEC. We believe that this will ensure transparency, effective oversight, and accountability over council matters. We will also submit to Parliament the Independent Municipal Demarcation Authority Bill. The amendments to the Municipal Demarcation Act are largely based on proposed proposals received from the Municipal Demarcation Board based on lessons learned over time. These lessons also form part of the 21-year review of local government, which we shall conclude this year. By utilizing the 21-year review prism, we shall be in a better position to introduce further reforms. During this month, the National Assembly passed the Municipal Systems Bill and referred it to the President to, for assent. This bill also standardizes the processes related to the appointment of municipal managers and managers directly accountable to the municipal manager. It also provides for competency criteria for such appointments whilst prohibiting the holders of such offices from political positions. We firmly believe that this legislative intervention, together with the provisions introduced through amendments to the Structures Act, will address many of the government's challenges that are facing the municipalities. On the 1st of November 2021, we successfully held our fifth free and fair local government elections we also noted the declining levels of voter participation, where 23 million of the 26 million registered voters voted. Following the elections, we have also seen 70 municipal councils with no outright majority, which could potentially result in instability in these hung councils. Honorable Speaker, last year, we reported that we would remodel the community works program, which in fact has had been the main source of our negative audit outcomes. We are pleased to say that from the piloting of the remodeling of CWP, we've already seen some improvements in the operational efficiency of the program. The savings realized through the remodeling allowed us to increase the daily stipend paid to participants from 97.50 to the current 110 per day. We have also increased the target number of participants from 250,000 to 255,000 within the existing budget allocations. This financial year, we have allocated 4.3 billion to the CWP. We intend to integrate the CWP into the core work of the department as we, com as we build community level resilience and ensure that we support community initiatives in the context of the DDM approach. We are confident that our new approach will ensure sustainability through meaningful work and economic activity and also through the training of the participants. Honorable members, DCOC is reviewing its organizational design. This will enable the department to entrench the district development model approach across the three spheres of government, whilst building resilience of communities. Through these budget votes, we are strengthening the capacity and capability 
of municipal institutions and traditional leadership, community organization and organs of state to implement and mainstream inclusive disaster risk reduction management strategies. We're also drawing lessons from all the society, from all of society approach we adopted in combating COVID-19. Even though we have not entirely won the battle, we take this opportunity to once again salute you, the people of South Africa who have heeded our calls and applied difficult safety measures. We must continue to apply the non-medical and preventive uh, measures, including masking, sanitizing, maintaining social distancing and vaccination. Such sacrifices have contributed to building resilience and minimizing the cost and effects of COVID-19. Unfortunately, of course, the measures we had applied to we have adopted are not always entirely understood and accepted by all. Consequently, we have had 109 court cases before the since 2020 March. So far, 92 of those cases have been finalized, and only four of the orders were in favor of the applicants means that by and large, the courts and the South Africans understood why we had to take such measures. Honorable Speaker, I wish to conclude by acknowledging the progress recorded by the National House of Traditional and Khoisan leadership leaders. For the first time in the history of the House, it is under the capable leadership of a woman. We are confident that the landscape of rural South Africa will change and the hopes and dreams of the rural masses will be realized with the Invest Rural Master Plan as the lodestar. The master plan was developed by traditional leaders after consultation with communities. It guides potential investors and all of society with regard to the areas of community investment, infrastructure, and the economy. With regards to community development, it prioritizes health education, financial inclusion, and food security. It also prioritizes investment in rural infrastructure, including ICT, renewable energy, as well as water and sanitation. With regards to economic growth areas, it prioritizes agriculture, tourism, manufacturing, and enterprise development, amongst others. It is indeed a plan by the people for the people. Thus, we intend to request government to integrate it into the economic development plans of the country. Amongst others, progress areas in this implementation of, is the implementation of the Customer Initiation Act of 2021, it regulates the registration of initiation schools so that it ensures that the initiation surgeons are trained and competent as protected. We have also recorded progress in the appointment of Khoisan Commission under the capable leadership of Professor Nick Botha to facilitate for formal recognition of the Khoisan communities and leadership. This will also add to the number of legally constituted tribal uh, councils which according to legislation should be completed by 31 March, 2023. The formula for determining the number of, of members traditional councils must therefore, must have therefore gazetted on the 4th of February, 2022, giving way for the legal institution of traditional councils. Deputy Minister Babela will elaborate on this and other promising plans in the traditional affairs space. For now, Minister. I wish to thank all the people I work with and request the House to support budget vote three and budget vote 15, which allocates 350 billion and 545 million over the MTSF. 
I thank you very much and hope that this will contribute to the eradication of hunger, poverty, unemployment, and inequality. Together, we can do more. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. The next speaker is the Honorable Klasa. Uh, Abashani Banga Pambi, Lugu Demarcation Board, Nessi RL Rights Commission. Malungu, a parliamentary beggar From the 3rd to the 4th of May 2022, the Portfolio Committee on Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs met and considered the 2022 23 annual performance plans, strategic plans and budgets of the departments and entities reporting to it. This consists of the Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, the uh, Municipal Infrastructure Support Agency, the Cultural Rights, Religious and Linguistic Rights Commission, the Municipal Demarcation Board and the South African Local Government Association. The Department of Cooperative Governance tabled its 2022-23 annual performance plan and budget in the aftermath of heavy rains, flooding, and strong winds, and landslides land that devastated various municipal areas in KwaZulu Natal and the Eastern Cape, which caused the loss of lives and damaged property, infrastructure, and the environment. Having received a comprehensive update from the department on the coordination of response and disaster recovery efforts, the portfolio committee is now ready to also lend a hand of support by visiting some of the affected areas. It will also be imperative for the committee to monitor the three annual performance targets envisaged under the National Disaster Management Center program to ensure that they contribute meaningfully towards enabling the provinces to deal effectively with the aftermath of the disaster. The other annual performance targets of interest relate to the department's local government support and interventions management program. There remains a legislative gap in respect of clarifying and regulating the process of intervention by one sphere of government uh, into another, as envisaged in section 100 and section 139 of the constitution. The lack of clarity and regulation often leads to the application of the intervention process that sometimes wasn't the problem it was meant to solve. As a result, there are many municipalities that have been under constitutional intervention but show little or no improvement. In this regard, the department the department's annual performance uh, 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 plan proposes the tabling of an intergovernmental monitoring support and intervention bill to address this legislative gap. The objectives of the bill are to, among other things, to regulate the implementation of the processes provided for in section 100 and section 139 of the constitution. However, however, the bill has been slow in coming as it has been in the pipeline since the time of the fourth administration. The deadlines for tabling the bill in parliament have kept shifting. It is the oversight duty, the portfolio committee's oversight duty 
to ensure that the department follow up on its long-standing commitment to table the bill. The portfolio committee notes the introduction with effect from 1 October 2021 of a new implementation policy for community works program in response to the committee's persistent demand for a clear plan and timeframes for the resolution of legacy issues in this program. This new model is still very much work in progress. It is not yet succeeding in ensuring that stipends are paid on time and that workers have adequate equipment to do the work. This is creating a negative perception around the utility of this program and raises questions on whether it is delivering value for money. The department will do well to conduct an evaluation and cost-benefit analysis of the program to assess whether it is serving its intended purpose and to determine whether the cost incurred uh, on this program is consistent with the benefit derived. On the annual performance target of the South African Local Government Association, the key message advanced was that local government is inadequately equipped to fulfill its developmental agenda. A number of root causes for this were put forward Amongst this was that there are inefficient and non-integrated local government delivery mechanisms, systems, and processes to, en to enable service delivery. Contributing to this, among other things, is the inappropriate allocation of functional roles between district municipalities and local municipalities. This was also raised strongly from the three district municipalities recently visited by the Portfolio Committee in the Free State Province. Mention was made of the devolution of certain legislated powers and functions from the districts to local municipalities, resulting in the district not receiving any government grants relating to this function. The districts have called for the devolution of these powers and functions to be revoked as to enable them to perform their legislated mandates. As the custodians of the laws governing local government, the Portfolio Committee is duty bound to investigate this matter further and make appropriate recommendations. A common theme across 2022-23 annual performance plan and budget presentations of the department, the SALGA, Municipal Demarcation Board, MESA, and the CRL Rights Commission was that their funding models were not sufficiently responsive to the responsibilities they are expected to fulfill. While the Portfolio Committee is sympathetic to these funding constraints and supports the augmentation of the budget shortfalls, it is necessary to impress that the existing budget allocations be used more efficiently and channeled more towards core service delivery objectives. Where allocations seem disproportionately skewed towards administrative overheads, there must be a coherent explanation as to why this is the case. In conclusion, the Portfolio Committee appreciates the fruitful, cordial, and constructive engagement with the Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs the, CR, the CRL Rights Commission, SALGA, Municipal Demarcation Board, MESA, 
on their 2022-23 annual performance plans, strategic plans, and budgets. We also would like to appreciate the contribution of committee members as well as uh, support staff for the committee. The committee supports the budget votes 3 and 15. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Member. The next speaker is the Honorable Brunk. Uh, Honorable House Chair, I'm delivering this speech on behalf of my colleague, uh, Honorable Salia Brunk, if that is in order with you. Please proceed, Honorable Member. Honorable Chairperson, disaster management uh, takes up a relatively small portion of the budget of the Department of Cooperative Governance. But in the past two years, it has consumed the lion's share of the minister and the department's attention. As we speak, another national disaster is unfolding. Within the next month, Nelson Mandela Bay will reach day zero. The taps are going to run dry. Both the municipality and the Eastern Cape Provincial Government have failed to put con effective contingency measures in place. The water crisis in Nelson Mandela Bay to a large extent, a man-made crisis, a political crisis, and it is made worse by neglect and ineptitude. There are other disasters in the making. Solplaiki, Mangaun, Mfuleni, Nsinduzung, Ugu, the municipalities that have become bywards for state failure. To be sure, the National Disaster Management Center must come to the assistance of the people of the Bay and soon. By managing the consequences of state failure at every sphere of government cannot become the main job of the Department of Cooperative Governance. Neither can national government intervention become the default response in all cases of political, of provincial and local state failure. There are hard limits to the capacity of national government, even in disasters and emergencies. Just consider what has happened recently in the flood ravaged KwaZulu Natal. Despite the declaration of a national state of disaster, electricity and water is yet to be reconnected to scores of communities across the province. The services that have been reconnected are unstable, and in any case, it is not clear what the progress is being made due to the national government's involvement. There has been extremely slow start to the work of the ad hoc committee established by Parliament to prevent the looting of disaster relief funds. The lesson is that the centralization of power and the concentration of resources in the hands of national government is not the solution to state failure. Not just because national government lacks the capacity to run the country from one center of power, but because in many instances, national government policy is the cause of the problem. Doubting down on the implementation of these policies will make things even worse. These are the problems ignored by the government's district development model and its main prospectus in favor of more centralized government. The Preferential Procurement Policy Framework Act has made every item and service needed by a municipality more expensive. By narrowing the pool of available suppliers, new municipal contracts are set up for an extremely high rate of litigation and failure. This is what Muletsi and Becky means when he describes BEE as institutionalized corruption. The legislative framework for institutionalized corruption was not created by provinces and municipalities, but by this parliament. And so the DA has formulated draft legislation in favor of non-racial procurement policy, one that will allow all state entities to procure the best value for money. But the problems that national government bequeaths to provinces and municipalities aren't limited to bad policies and bad laws. Often, national government simply fails to fulfill its own core functions, and municipalities are then left to deal with the consequences. In large parts of the country, including metros, the criminal assault on electricity installations and infrastructure is reaching crisis levels. 
This is no longer just a matter of policing. It is a matter of cooperative governance. Recently, a criminal gang uh, in Joburg took control of an entire electricity substation operating with near military type efficiency. Most cable thieves now have the upper hand over police stations when it comes to logistics and intelligence. While station commanders scramble to find vehicles to dispatch to the scene of a cable theft, the criminals have all the resources needed to do their job. The assault of municipal infrastructure has devastating consequences for communities and basic service delivery. Think of how many substations, feeder cables and protection gear forming part of municipal reticulation networks are being operated way out of their own life cycle. Now, add to the effect poor maintenance, the extreme wear and tear caused by load shedding and the unavailability of qualified electrical engineers. Only then does it become clear how fragile the infrastructure is that these criminals are striking at and why communities suffer power outages beyond load shedding. The DA has made concrete proposals on how service infrastructure can be secured against criminal attack, including the establishment of specialized units. These measures do not require national government to exercise more power and more control, but it use its existing powers and to optimize its current resources. Lastly, in many instances, the answer to better service delivery is exact opposite of centralization. And so, the city of Cape Town is better able to manage the rail network than National Department of Transport. With a go-ahead of National Treasury, the city will now complete a feasibility study into taking over commuter rail networks. If devolution of powers and functions can lead to better rail services for commuters in Cape Town, surely Mayor Jordan Lil Lewis deserves the minister's support. As my colleague Honorable Eleanor Spies will point out, the budget and strategy of the department do not seem to match the commitment required from the department to fulfill its core functions. Therefore, the DA cannot support this vote. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. The next speaker is Honorable Kalipi. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Chairperson, the EFF rejects Budget Vote 3 of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs. As we speak here today, Chair, departmental report indicates that 64 municipalities in the country are considered high risk and dysfunctional, while 111 municipalities are considered medium risk, but also highly dysfunctional. There are only 16 municipalities that are considered stable in this country, or oh, a big joke. The dysfunctional state of municipalities has been public knowledge for a while, and yet there seems to be no appetite for fixing the mess that is in these municipalities by the ANC. Year after year, the Auditor General makes almost the same findings about these municipalities. This are lack of internal controls, inability to attract and retain skilled staff, deeply embedded corruption, inability to manage finance and to raise funds. Yet there is no overarching vision to change these inefficiencies in municipal governance. There is a little appetite in government for relooking and at a structure of municipal funding, which favors more urban municipalities where residents are able to pay their rates and self-finance the operations at the municipalities. Rural municipalities, Chairperson, do not have that luxury and are often only able to pay salaries and deliver the bare minimum when it comes to services. Cocta has failed to provide decisive leadership on the dysfunctional municipalities and the management are pushing away officials with experience in order to accommodate their friends and close cronies in the department under the minister's favorite DG and under her leadership, victimization of senior officials is the order of the day. As a result, well-experienced senior officials are leaving the department. The most disgraceful 
of this municipal failures is the lack of agency in which the disaster of KwaZulu-Natal Eastern Cape Northwest has been handled by both the department and the portfolio committee. Members of the portfolio committee have on several times requested to, to the committee to do oversight in KZN, Eastern Cape and Northwest, but all this has felt on deaf ears. We know very well, Chairperson, what is the reason? It's because the ruling elite does not care about the poorest of the poor who are affected by the recent floods. Victims who reside in areas which are not suitable for human settlement have no place to stay, and it does not look like they will be getting any assistance from anyone in the government anytime soon. You know why? Because these poor, the rest of the poor, they don't matter to the elite known as the ANC. Both the committee and the department have deserted our people. Minister, you are the custodian of the Disaster Management Act, but the disaster management within the department under your leadership is a disaster itself. We recently conducted oversight in the Free State, Chairperson, and the state of municipalities in that province is shameful. In all 23 municipalities of Free State, you find mayors fighting with municipal managers for the control of tender opportunities. This happens while our people are crying out for services. In Mangaung, aging infrastructure and lack of service delivery have rendered resident areas in their own municipality. Nothing moves there, and yet there is no intervention of kind from the department. This department is toothless, in short, Chairperson. Mayors and speakers have become rogue, as demonstrated by the conduct of the speaker of the Makutu Tomaha local municipality, who gave orders to an opposition councillor, Maeba Robert of NCC, to be handcuffed and tied to a steel pole for merely demanding accountability for the municipality. Two MPEG chairpersons in Mohalakwena municipality in Lipopo chairperson have been killed. And the suspicion is that they, they were killed because they were demanding accountability on corruption that is stinking in that municipality. The Macedoniana mayor is arrested as we speak and his municipal manager is under investigation for 5.9 million for security company belongs to him and the former mayor. And yet he was given a security tender for the municipality. The MM who is there in the uh, municipality, he do as he pleases in that municipality with no consequences or no action against him. This is proven by the investigation which is taking forever while the abuse of the municipality funds continues on daily basis. The community works program has been used as a tool for looting and has not had the intended outcomes of empowering people and alleviating poverty. This concerns is always dominating portfolio committee when we are engaging with the department. But it's clear, both the minister and the DG have no appetite to keep such corruption. The question then arises, who is benefiting under this looting from this program? Time will tell. Chairperson, Kungashona Ilanga, if I have to, if I were to mention all rotten things that are happening in municipalities under the ANC. In short, ANC have turned municipalities into dens of heartless thieves who are cruel, vicious, dangerous. The painful part is that poorest of the poor are the one who must face hardship and suffer the most, and thieves are in control in municipalities. Chairperson, as I conclude, we would like to commend people of Ward 3 in Pokwane in Northern Cape and Ward 5 in Mafikeng, who rejected ANC and voted for EFF in the recent by-elections. People were simply communicating that is in Dozi Shinjile in Ward 3 in Pokwane and Ward 5 in Mafikeng. So therefore, Chair, we are rejecting this budget as EFF. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Member. The next speaker is the Honorable Princess Putelezi. Honorable Putelezi, are you there? Uh, Chairperson, it seems. Uh, I, will, I, I, will then, I will then call upon Nkosi Putelezi.
to do the speech. Honorable Chairperson, I think uh, both of them are having connectivity problems in KZN. Can I do it on behalf of uh, Honorable Princess A. Butelezi? Yes, please proceed, Honorable C. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, we have strong institutional mechanisms brought to life in terms of our constitution with the sole purpose of strengthening democracy and building on the vision of a united nation. However, these institutions cannot become yet another forum to line the pockets of officials. What purpose do these institutions serve if the people of South Africa do not physically benefit from their work? The Commission for the Promotion and Protection of the Rights of Cultural, Religious and Linguistic Communities has a critical duty in terms of our constitution. It is undeniable that our beloved country is facing political and social turmoil, and now more than ever before, the CRL Rights Commission's mandate to promote unity within cultural, religious, and linguistic communities is essential. The Commission must therefore function optimally, and we need to ask ourselves whether the Commission is honestly serving the people of South Africa. Although the IFP fully endorses the Portfolio Committee's view, that the funding of the CLRL Rights Commission must be on par with the scale of duties the Commission has to fulfill. We cannot accept that 65% of the Commission's budget is allocated towards internal administration instead of service delivery. This fact cannot and should not be accepted. Chairperson, and the IFP has consistently and adamantly called for the strengthening of cooperation between traditional leaders and formal governance structures. Traditional leaders speak on behalf of millions of South Africans, and they cannot play second fiddle in the developmental agenda. The IFP therefore welcomes the publication of guidelines on Section 24 of the Traditional and Khoisan Leadership Act, which regulates partnership between traditional leaders and government. However, as the IFP, we must stress that such partnerships should provide for true cooperation and not only pay lip service to the Act. The IFP also strongly agrees with the Portfolio Committee's recommendation that a cost-benefit analysis of the government's community work program must be undertaken. We remain highly concerned that despite the fact that 85% of the department's funds for programs are allocated to this program, it is not serving its critical purpose, which is to create employment opportunities in rural communities. The people of South Africa deserve answers and deserve an accountable, transparent, and responsible government. Further, Honorable Chairperson, there was a media clip this morning that uh, I think it was Amatola Municipality was writing off almost a billion run in unpaid service charges. The question is, what systems do they have in the first instance to apply the user pay principle. Why do they have to wait when things reach such critical proportions to then apply for write-off, which is at the detriment of service delivery in that particular municipality? Surely, Honorable Minister, we have a school of national government and we have a department of public service and administration. And to this end, qualified financial officers should be drawn to service municipalities or to work within municipalities. Much of the problems with regard to poor audit outcomes are as a result of financial officers not doing their basic or not performing their basic functions of keeping records and getting things straight in terms of the MFMA. This is an area, Honorable Minister, that you need to look at quite seriously so that we can get qualified people to assist in the management and administration of finances of municipalities. Finally, uh, Honorable Minister, uh, I see that the MEC of KwaZulu Natal has been redeployed to your department. And I must say he was trigger happy when it came to applying Section 139 to municipalities. And I hope that will stop now because there was a tendency to apply 139 in certain municipalities which were not managed by the ruling national ruling party. I hope you can look into this and that the new MEC won't pull the trigger all the time. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. We will support this budget vote. Thank you, Honorable Singh. As I invite the next speaker, I'm also requesting the Honorable Mashlaule to preside over the remainder of this mini plenary. The next speaker is the Honorable I. Grunewald. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. The first lesson of economics is scarcity, 
Thus, the fact that there is never enough of anything to fully satisfy all those who want it. The first lesson of politics is to disregard the first lesson of economics. This is said by the economist Thomas Sowell. In the post-lockdown economy of local government, there must be looked at reality on the ground where the people of South Africa have been hit hard due to the failing economy, especially on local sphere of government, and is still placed under further pressure due to raising costs in fuel and other input costs. The declining economy with raising costs will further result in a loss of employment that will result in less income for local government. Local government is of view that by raising levies and taxes will result in a revenue enhancement. Yet it will reach a point where that is not the case if you study the law of a curve, which shows the relationship between tax rates and the amount of tax revenue collected by governments. The curve is used to illustrate the argument that sometimes cutting tax rates can result in increased total tax revenue. Given the scarcity of revenue and financial resources, it is of paramount importance that the municipality focus all the efforts on the creation of a business-friendly environment to attract investment, especially for SMMEs. Apart from the broadening of their revenue base, it will also stimulate local economy, economies and create much-needed jobs in our communities. Specific preference must be given to prioritize infrastructure collapse. The minister says that MISA sent qualified engineers to various municipalities. The point must be raised as to why the municipalities didn't appoint such engineers in the first place. It is, however, not possible under the ANC government to create an environment for prosperity. The ANC is a selfish government that only care about money and how much they can annex share in levies and taxes rather than to put money back in the pockets of ordinary law-abiding citizens of South Africa. The ANC wants to be populistic and complain for votes rather than to admit their failures as government. The ANC is not a caring government. Local governments should be able to recognize the opportunity cost in these daring times and not make populistic decisions. Local government must understand the fact that it isn't business as usual and make provision for economies to grow. Put policies in place so that there is a relief, even for the elderly and disabled citizens, and not only for those that are homeowners, but for those that are renting or as a user for term. Local government must stop spending money on big billboard marketing, ANC ideology, and keep on telling citizens that everything is going to be okay. Even that we know infrastructure is collapsing, financial management is crumbling, and service delivery is non-existing. In the Green Drop audit, it is reported that municipalities is responsible for putting more than 1.5 gigaliter of raw sewage in our fresh water resources. This is equal to 62% of the total volume of the Val Dam. No one, no one plan um, can address this if there is no political will, Honourable Minister. The Deputy President on 9 December 2021 answered the question posted to him by the Freedom Front Plus as to why government outstanding useful account is not paid. He answered that the reason is that municipalities could not deliver correct accounts to government, and will it be paid as soon as they have the correct account? If the Deputy Minister as leader of government gives such an answer, municipalities must take note that they should take care, extra care in delivering correct service accounts to all communities before communities take the advice of leader of government. What is good for the goose must be good for the gander. On the other side, I would advise government that they set an example. Therefore, we urge that all government debt must be settled within 30 days, especially the service accounts to municipalities. Achbar Speaker, the bewijzen van die ANC is onvermoed de regeres voor die hand liggen. Een plaaslijke regering onder ANC beheer sal die corruptie en bedrog vind, nepotisme en municipale bestuurders wat groter salaris as die president van Zuid-Afrika ontvangt, brandweerwand sonder water soos die klegeen reveer municipaliteit, swak financiële bestuur, wetteloosheid, tenentrepeneers, kaderontplooiing, spookwerkers, interne gevechten, swak leiderskap, intimidatie en algemene kriminaliteit. In die bewijse lee in artikel 106 versla, auditeers generaal versla, forensies onderzoek versla, die groen druppel en blauw druppel verslag en soveel ander. Wat jy nie in ANC regering sal vind nie, is infrastructuur en standhouding en ontwikkeling, ekonomische groei, gevolgbestuur, onpopulistische besluit in die beste belang van die dorp en alse gemeenskappe, pad to pele, suksesvolle investeringsprojekte, goeie bezigingspraktijk, waardes en professionaliteit. The Honorable Minister in the opening today alerted the public how many interventions the department did in local government and is proud of these deployments. Honorable Minister, this is proof that local government is failing miserably. The time has come for communities to reprioritize representation rather than government that wants to reprioritize communities again. ANC government promises can be seen year after year in the ever increasing decay of local government. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. May I now call the Honorable the Deputy Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, the Honorable Bapela. 
uh, House Chairperson, Honorable Members, Minister Nkosaza Nadlamini Zuma, Deputy Minister Atembi Ngadiming, Chairperson and Deputy Chairperson of the National House of Traditional and Question Leaders, the Salga Leadership, CRL Commission, and the Demarcation Board Leadership present, ladies and gentlemen. The Traditional and Question Leadership Act of 2019 was signed into law by the President to commence on the 1st of April 2021, and this is a major milestone for the traditional and question leadership sector. In March this year, we launched the awareness campaign on the National Question Commission, which was held in Cape Town as a symbolic venue and place where the first dispossession of land and the first clashes and battles between the indigenous and the settlers took place in 1657. The commission is tasked with the responsibility to deal with applications for the recognition of the question structures and their communities. Some community members have already submitted their applications and the commission continues to receive more applications, which process will end in March 2024 and hope that a lot of them will then take advantage of this particular activity. Amongst other priorities, the implementation of the TKLA is to address the current challenges of our traditional councils not being legally constituted. Our enemy is now also uh, still there, unfortunately, which is the high number of, of fertilities arising from the customary initiation practice and to eliminate the illegal schools and the illegal traditional surgeons. As we are approaching the winter initiation season, our plans and energies will be focusing on saving and protecting the lives of young people who are about to undergo the cultural practice of initiation. Our objective as government is zero death, as one death is one too many. This we can achieve through the provision of the law. And we also need the traditional leaders to work together with parents, communities, as well as other social partners. We are led to announce that the Customary Initiation Act was enacted in 2021 and commenced on the 1st of September 2021 as a legal tool that is now available to assist government to achieve this objective of zero death. As a, as a critical part of implementing this act, the minister established the National Initiation Oversight Committee at the national level and in October 2021 to oversee implementation of the act. We appreciate also the provinces that have started also establishing the Provincial Initiation Coordinating Committees. We are closely monitoring the over 60,000 initiates in Pumalanga who are undergoing initiations for this year. They are already in the schools and, 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 and then they are there. We are, however, worried as we observe the rise of illegal initiation schools is still rampant and we are on high alert due to the trend of the abductions that are still unfortunately taking place. Certainly, as we present this budget, we have received reports that 13 initiates have died in Pumalanga, thus uh, reversing our objective of zero death. And we send condolences to their families. As other children will be undergoing the initiation in June, in Limpopo, Eastern Cape, and the Free State, we'll also be putting these provinces on high alert as we are now doing uh, in Pumala. Honorable members, in March last year, the cabinet resolved on the processes of consultations on the question of the communal land tenure, which process is led by the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform, and Rural Development, working with the Department uh, of Traditional Affairs. These consultations were meant to culminate in the convening of the land summit, of which the resolution was taken at the Indian Indigenous in Daba held in 2017 to have a land summit that discusses and resolves on the 13% of the land. The cabinet has announced that the land summit will be held later this month. This is after extensive consultations of various stakeholders conducted, uh, such as the provincial houses, Contralesa, National Question Council, Civil Society, Academics, and Land Experts. The Department of Agriculture, Land Reform, and Rural Development and the Department of Traditional Affairs assist with the preparatory work in order to ensure that the plan summit is successful. With our continuous engagement with the traditional leaders and 
with the EJA to resolve challenges uh, that uh, have uh, uh, raised over the time with government. President Ramaphosa established an interministerial task team chaired by the deputy president that will focus on the resolution of these matters. The MTT is split into the following working streams. One, uh, advancing land ownership, tenure rights, and fast-tracking social economic development of rural communities. It will be led by the Minister of Agriculture, Land Reform, and Rural Development. That's where the Minister of Minerals will also be included, really to resolve on all those particular issues of economic development. Building institutional capacity and ensuring support to traditional leaders. It will be led by the Minister of Finance. I think on this one, many honorable members during the appearance of the committee will be complaining about the lack of funding to it. It's inadequate. The house is not adequately funded. CRL is not adequately funded. And then the traditional leaders also have been complaining about issues of the tools of trade. And we hope therefore that will resolve a number of issues under this particular uh, a work stream. The third, advancing infrastructure investment and skills development in rural communities, which will be led by public works and infrastructure. Lloyd, the minister spoke about the Invest Rural Master Plan, which still has to be included as a program of government, will also help us in really begin to look at the investment in that area. Because for you to attract investment in the rural areas, we must deal with the infrastructure challenges. The fourth one is the promoting unity social cohesion and nation building in rural communities led by the Minister of Sports, Arts and Culture. And that's where then the traditional leaders will also add their voice to issues that are of a challenge on social cohesion uh, in the rural areas in particular, working with other institutions. And the first ranking, which is the last work stream uh, on the finalizations of policy, legislation, and constitutional matters, which will be led by the Minister of Justice and Correctional Services. On fighting uh, gender-based violence, there's an initiative by the Deputy Minister of Sports, Arts and Culture, who is collaborating with other deputy ministers, including us, to focus on areas where there are high incidents of gender-based violence and femicide, especially focusing on the rural areas, whilst everybody is focusing on the urban. The area of Lusukisigi in the OR time was visited in March this year as a known uh, area of rape capital. It has the highest acts of violence against women and children, it is a crime against our common humanity, and, and we need to deal with those particular challenges. We are working together with the traditional leaders on this program, and we'll be spreading it to other areas where, where we will then be working in ensuring that the traditional leaders in those areas are, are there. The Invest Real Master Plan, the minister has really engaged uh, adequately on it, so uh, I was uh, also including in it. I just want, as I conclude, then really say, the CRL uh, has an allocation of 47 million rand uh, as a budget, and then and they've just completed uh, engagements and investigations on the religious abuse, and then and the other program that they will be embarking on, which they've started with the Eastern Cape, is around the initiations, as they did in Gauden, they'll go in there, understand the challenges, and also advise on areas of intervention so that we can save lives. The implementation of the TKLA and the implementation of the cultural initiation bill, they are all supported by the institutional support with a 91 million rent uh, that then goes into it, but all other programs are also included there. And, and, and therefore, we'll then also be working to mobilize the traditional leaders to really work within the DTM model and ensuring that their role is well-defined so that we will then work as a collective in that. With that, Chair, I'll just say the road will not be easy. We'll encounter challenges, but we'll overcome them and move on in making sure that the traditional leaders and communities will experience development and show quality of life. It is improved for the better people in the rural areas. Thank you, Siabo. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Deputy Minister. The next speaker will be the Honorable Zungula from the ATM. Thank you, Chairperson. COPTA is critical as it deals with the institutions that engage directly with the citizens. It is therefore imperative that this department has got clear set programs to uplift traditional and religious institutions and municipalities to best serve the people. This would ensure citizens' needs are heeded to by these institutions. Traditional leadership must not be ceremonial 
traditional leadership must play a meaningful role in the development of the country. This would be achieved by also increasing the number of permanent members in the House of Traditional Leaders. In all areas under traditional leadership, the budget must be administered by INCO CNDAO. Amakos need to be more active in the promotion of the indigenous languages and traditions so as to best preserve our heritage. In course, it can't be made non-entities by taking the management of the budget of rural areas to councillors. And in course, it has no say about the development. Rural development is critical to ensure mass migration to cities is reversed. The economy of rural areas must circulate amongst the people in those rural areas, and the people must be the primary beneficiaries. Umshaba Ukona, the government must provide mechanisms for farming in all villages. We can't have people in villages with a guard in Amasin, but they buy the most basic produce from supermarkets. Aban to Mabalim and the government must provide. The church plays a critical role in shaping the moral fiber of the people. Government must deal with the bogus churches who prey on people's beliefs. Indigenous churches must be supported by, by all means possible. Cocta must lead in protecting the faiths of our people, particularly the indigenous churches that are ignored and sidelined. It can't be that in South Africa, Ama Nazareth are still forced to cut their hair and their beliefs they are violated, whereas the beliefs and practices of other faiths is protected. In Koloye to Yagwandu must be protected and its dignity affirmed by the government. Government can't ignore our indigenous faiths and but prioritize foreign religions that have come to our country. The CRL Commission must protect all faiths and hold accountable. Why are you doing this? Hold accountable all faiths. It must not appear to be targeting certain Christian leaders. In lastly, Chair, would like to wish all apostles, as led by Umnichane, Umkwenkwezana, Umeva Mklope, the Chief Apostle Nongunga, a successful Apostle Day. Utiko Pilayo, Utiko Bapostile, Abenani, Kalemini, Iketekileyo, Inuele. I thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. The next speaker will be Honorable Taba Nchaba of the ANC. Thank you, Honorable Chaperson. Greeting to the Honorable Minister, Deputy Ministers, and Honorable Members. I rise on behalf of the African National Congress to support this budget vote number three and number 15. This budget addresses the key issues that the people of South Africa in their local communities are concerned about. The issues of unemployment, social cohesion, and social development are very important in the in, and the government must address them uh, properly. This budget comes against the backdrop of the economic reconstruction and recovery plan that was announced by the president following the negative impact of COVID-19 not, not only community life, but even on our economy, which was already struggling. It also comes at a time when there is food insecurity and our communities following the July social unrest last year. And now the rising food prices due to the war in Europe. Government must work together with other stakeholders, such community leaders, businesses, traditional leaders, and faith-based organization within the community to ensure that communities maintain harmony and social cohesion. We welcome we welcome the fact that the community works program continues 
to be a priority in the budget in the medium term. The, the allocation will increase from 4.3 billion in 20, from 2022 to 2023. In 2024 to 2025, it will be 4.5 billion. We are concerned about the challenges around the CWP, which results in delayed payment to participants, which causes the incomplete project. This must be resolved to ensure that the CWP does what we want it to do, and that is provide short-term uh, short employment in poor communities and ensure that youth participants acquire skills in order to access the permanent jobs in the labor market. Salo, Namalunga, Ashon Pegil. We are chabuli saga noko ubona lomiango. Oh no, cause logu logu tutu logu kutaza o maspala ukutiba nikezele abandu bagiti into tugo eba faneli. Kubandu basema kaya, kubandu basema tolope ni naguma kosi agiti in tabuko. Logu fuselewa kwama sigo eight. Si komiti si ke sa yogwenza inko lovo e si fundazwe ni sa se free state la postole kona inko si e undabezita wasema luta pofung obe kala ngo wuti kuno muntu oz biza ngo skepa onge yona inko si onjo onja umsaba wake se akela age wuti umyango no ngongo shikebe zame wuti ba inge tise inko si ipume Gulo 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 Baze bala shekelwa izi shobo zabo, imizi yabo na kogonke wabo. Agatebe na ako. Sitike. Uhulume, uhu. Siyabonga, siyabonga, siyabonga. Honorable, siyabonga. Iskat sispelile. Singu. The next speaker will be honorable. Kansa ake, ipache divoti, ngeabonga. Siyabonga. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Chairperson. The National Freedom Party, I note the budget vote 3 and 15 tabled here today. The National Freedom Party will support this budget vote. However, I wish to raise uh, the following concerns. Honorable Minister, if you remember through you, Chairperson, last year sometimes I requested that we provide a comprehensive list of all the contracts uh, that have been awarded in the local municipalities, particularly in KwaZulu Natal, in the last year or two, names of the companies, names of the directors, and the value of those contra contracts, including cost per item, to see that we've got value for money. But more importantly, to introduce a transparent and credible process, so on a monthly basis, we could advertise these contracts that have been awarded to ensure that we get value for money and it is not exploited by a few people as honorable mkalipi said from the eff on how the bee processes are being exploited in the country i also want to raise my concern you know i thought that in introducing the district uh, development model i thought we're actually going to be cutting the cost of, of administration in fact, I thought we were going to one of the countries like Canada where you have a two-tier government, a national and a district, and remove the rest so more money can go towards delivering services. But now it seems like we are heading for a fourth tier of government, which means more money will be spent on administration. Those that don't perform the local government level now means district level will come to do exactly the same thing 
It's like the oversight mechanisms we have in the country. Every sphere of government conducts oversight, despite that the delivery of services is not forthcoming. The other problem, uh, 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 Chairperson, is the fact that the amount of collusion and corruption that's taking place on the procurement process. Right now, as I speak to you, the control that mayors and deputy mayors have in this local government level the collusion that takes place, the meetings that are taking place to overthrow other political parties, the amount of money that is changing hands is the reason why we cannot deliver service to the people on the ground. Until you have an independent process, entirely independent, where no politician, no mayor, deputy mayor, no political party is involved in the appointment of, of officials, CFOs, municipal managers and things, you will continue to have what we have today. And that is uh, one of the lowest levels of delivery of services. And that's why we tend to have so much of it. Then the other problem that we tend to have is, if you look at thank the issue you. of the flood. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable uh, uh, thank, you. thank you. The NFP will support the budget vote. Thank you. Thank you. May I now call the Honorable, the Deputy Minister of Cooperative of, uh, Governance and Traditional Affairs, the Honorable Nkadime. House Chair, the Minister of uh, Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, Dr. Nkosa Zanatlamini Zuma, Deputy Minister Obed Papela, the Chairperson of the National House of Traditional Leaders, Zuma Mamsawi. Honorable members, good evening. It is my honor and privilege to join the minister in presenting the budget of the department. And I want to thank my predecessor, Honorable Park Stowe, for the work done trying to improve the capacity of the department and the foundation for the work done to ensure the performance of local government and ensuring that local government does become everybody's business. I know that my predecessor did participate in the previous quarter budget votes in line with our mandate, but also guided by the departmental strategic plan. Since my arrival in the department, I have had the opportunity to relook in the work that he has done, but also got myself acquainted with the departmental core mandate, key concerns and challenges, but also to shape and guide the district development model. This is an, eff an effort that is an effective and efficient way of how local government through an integrated approach of government needs to run. To this effect, this vote is rightfully premised, therefore, on the principles that are cognizant of the need of the three spheres, which are yet distinct, independent, and interrelated. To deal with these challenges, which seems to be complex in the sphere itself, we need all of us to have a societal-based approach which can only be realized through the district developmental module, which implores all components of government to function cohesively as a whole and effectively to deliver a capable and a developmental state. It is within this context, therefore, honorable members, that section 154 of the constitution is important to ensuring that we strengthen our municipalities in pursuit for the objects of local government contained in section 152. Our budget vote is strategically enabling conducive con conditions to collectively harness all the public resources by culminating into one plans, which are also operational and model to ensure stability in municipalities. So we're working with all the stakeholders to assist to put the municipalities to work better. For example, in Northwest, it was agreed during the recent in presidential meeting so that municipalities like Makwasi Hills, Isobota and Mamusa will be assisted by the department to put criminal charges against those who have been implement, implicated in the fraudulent activities. Honorable Mkalipi, following the presentation of the state of local government to cabinet, a framework of own municipal support for those 64 municipalities and intervention plans was developed to guide and assist 23 of those 64 municipalities, we've already assisted them in ensuring that they follow these plans to ensure that progress is registered and they get out of the dysfunctional state that they are in. But further than that, Honorable Minister, for example, made an example of the part of that 64 in Okumkijima in Mangaung municipality, but we did not end there. 
a collaboration between Cocta and National Treasure further looked into further 46 municipalities which are having developed difficulties financially to additionally approve and develop economic recovery plans for them to ensure that they also are integrated into one plan and can be able to function properly and support the services of the people. So in both the sections of the one plan, section 154 and 139 are enjoined to build capacity, transfer the skill, bring personnel, but subsequently leave the municipality capable to run its own. In the recent Free State Imbizo, for example, much as yes, the committee visited their challenges, but for example, in water bulk municipal supply was identified in the presidential Imbizo as a catalytic project. As we speak, it runs for 46 kilometers. As we speak, 28 kilometers of that pipeline have been completed. At its completion, 5,776 households will benefit, and a total of 21 local subcontractors have been uh, uh, appointed in line with our SMMP development project. So to boost the 70% MIG non-spending that the minister spoke about in capacitating our municipalities, our water service infrastructure MIG has been remodeled with the assistance of the department through MISA to ensure that in all the 23 plus in the 46 municipalities, we get an end roll of that. Honorable C, we have put an intergovernmental monitoring support and intervention bill. Currently, there's no legislation which regulates interventions in the provinces, that is section 100 and section 139 in municipalities. The MEC might have sounded trigger hip, but it is better to act as early as warning signs are received or are shown in the quota reports that are received by MECs subsequently a provincial treasurer to assist municipalities. But we will be tabulating for all, as you know, the, 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 the act itself to be to ensure that we fill the void and regulate the interventions in 400 and 189, but also aligning them to what the Municipal Finance Management Act says with regard to discretionary financial interventions. As indicated by Minister Zoom, keep uh, sustainability and financial viability all municipalities is also realized by the training of municipal uh, public accounts committees, which will assist uh, honorable members with the capacity, but also accountability of municipalities. And a training uh, for all the teams, 257 municipalities and their impact has already happened at the beginning of this first term, five months old into their job. The Municipal Infrastructure Support Agents continue to support identified municipalities to ensure that, for example, 14 of them, their social and labor plans are integrated into their work plans, but ultimately their IDPs. And this total of municipalities are Elias Mutualit, Lepala, Le Morale City, Murafo, Rand West City, Rustenburg, Moses Kotane, Madibeng, Matoseng, Emalasheni, Steve Church, Machabeng, so we are not only practicalizing, what, we are not only mentioning the one plan, but we are intimate practicalizing it. Together with Siba and Yemani, we will be planning to put the training of the minds that is there. In line with our integrated urban development program, which is a framework which gives us the development of smart cities, but also the regeneration of small towns, which we have already picked up out of the 100 small cities for the generation of smart cities, three have already been piloted and approved in a strategy of small town regeneration that has been adopted uh, by cabinet. In Western Cape, we've taken the Pickett municipality in Limpopo, Modimule, and uh, it's also municipality in the first state. There could be challenges in the first state, but yes, not everything is doom and gloom. I would like to commend those communities to ensure that they are they participate in the programs that the municipalities do. I would also want to thank the Minister for Cocta, Dr. Lamini Nkosazana Zuma, and my Deputy Minister, Fred Comrade Mabela, for their leadership as well as officials in the Department of Traditional Affairs for their dedication, support, and the work that we would want uh, to achieve. But lastly, Chair, let me also elaborate and clear the issue that we are refusing with the, 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 the site visit of the a, 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 a committee to come to KZN for the disaster. On the 3rd of May, the, 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 the department provided a report and were ready to host 
the committee, the portfolio committee, to look into the challenges that happened in the disaster in KZN. So it is what Amigras, uh, Amilka Cabral says, tell no lies, tell no easy victories. We are not running away for an audit or for a review of what has happened on Arum Kani. We've provided a report to the committee and we're ready at any time to host to Gabong. We don't want a report. We want to be with our people. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Minister of Cities. What smart cities when... Can you come down? Can you all of you come down? Uh, may I indicate that I'm currently under uh, load shading. I will prefer to have my video uh, down. Uh, thank you, Honorable Members. Our next speaker will be Honorable Mpumza. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Chair of the House. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, uh, Minister and Deputy Ministers, uh, honorable members and leaders of uh, the entities reporting to the Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs. Chair, allow me to keep my video off. Chairperson and honorable members, deepening the implementation of the district development model to eradicate local economic development is a must. Chair, we are rising on behalf of the African National Congress to support budget vote free of cooperative governments. We are of the firm view that this vote supports critical aspects of the economic reconstruction and recovery plan, as outlined by the president, in order to rebuild our economy following the COVID-19 pandemic. We must be intentional about addressing the economic fault lines of the upper third speciality. The post-COVID-19 economy must be decentralized and unleashed to the untapped potential of our districts and local municipalities, which had been regarded as the barrier of the mainstream economy. The role of the state at the local level in driving economic development and transformation at the macro level is critical for safe setting South Africa on a more inclusive growth trajectory. We have made significant strides in the transformation of our society and advancing towards a truly non-racial, non-sexist, and truly democratic society. However, in the local sphere, we are yet to achieve what was intended in the 1998 White Paper on Local Government when it indicated a task of a developmental local government, among other things, uh, to meet the developmental objectives which will keep and create a better life for all. As the ANC were unapologetic in actually supporting this budget as an instrument to drive thorough economic transformation in line with the NDP and its vision to eliminate poverty and reduce inequality. Chair, we know that infrastructure is the largest spending program in the economic development function in the budget delivered by the Minister of Finance. Despite the fiscal pressures, capital expenditure programs are protected from budget reduction, and this is evident of the ANC government's commitment to invest in infrastructure, which is a catalyst for economic growth. In order to fund a new bulk water projects and maintain raw infrastructure, spending on national water resource management, is expected to grow from 36.1 billion in 2022-23 financially to 36.6 to 8.6 billion in 2024-2025. Our firm view is that local industries must be the major suppliers in these projects, as localization has been and is central in the economic recovery and recovery plan. However, we are concerned about the declining allocation towards the municipal infrastructure support agent, more so following an increase in their target outputs from seven in 2020-2021 to 11 in 2022-2023, adding new responsibilities. As part of our oversight work, we must ensure that the infrastructure projects are driven through localization using South African suppliers materials and construction companies. An emphasis should be placed on the empowering young women, young people, women and cooperatives as suppliers 
uh, for this material in order to build the economy. Honorable members, we remain convinced that the challenges of resource constraint confronting the local government can best be addressed through the district development model, which is intended to foster practical intergovernmental relations to plan budget and implement jointly to provide current responses and maximize impact. Honorable Chair, having piloted the TDM in three municipalities and drawing lessons from successful implementation throughout the country, the one plans for all the 44 districts and seven metropolitan municipalities have been developed and we are steaming ahead. Some of the successes seen in the pilot stages include the OR term of 50 small micro enterprise, medium enterprises and cooperatives that have received support from the district and partners in the form of financial support and equipment necessary to unlock their business potential. This includes 470 young people who are employed in the solid waste recycling program of King Sabata Talimbe Jabba Municipality and the support that MESA is giving on green and cleaning the city itself of Amtata. We are aware that this particular program is being implemented in the district focusing on number of sectors, including furniture manufacturing with the fan tank to provide almost 30, uh, which supports 30 SMEs entrepreneurs, similar achievements in Etegwini and Etegwini Metro and Waterbed District municipality uh, can be cited. We are therefore share welcoming the prioritization of the TTM in the budget of the department and SALGA and the ANC support the budget. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, honorable member. The next speaker will be honorable Spice from the DA. Represented Peace. My apologies, Honourable Spies. <laughs> um, good evening, Honourable House Chair and Honourable Members. 163 municipalities are under financial duress. 108 municipalities have unfunded budgets and 29 municipalities have been placed under administration. This is the real state of local government in South Africa. Yet, a whopping 4.3 billion rand of this department's program budget is spent on the Community Works Program. This constitutes 85.1% of the funds directly administered by the department and excludes transfers to municipalities, SALGA, the Municipal Demarcation Board, the Municipal Infrastructure Support Agency, and the South African Sister Cities Network. Government support and intervention only gets 2.6% of the budget. Institutional development, 1.5%. The Municipal Systems Improvement Grant, 2.7%. And the National Disaster Management Center is at 2.1%. The Community Works Program is definitely not serving its intended purpose and there's definitely no return on investment whatsoever. There is just no justification for spending 4.3 billion rand on this program, as this is not the core function of this department. What is worse is that the 4.3 billion does not benefit the very people that this program is intended for. Community Works Program participants on the ground earns a meager 880 rand per month and every month it is a battle for them to get this money paid to them on time. Today I'm speaking on behalf of the thousands of CWP workers who must beg for this stipend for days on end each and every month, each time and after numerous questions and inquiries to the minister, I get the same answer. We have implemented a new remodeling policy and we are having challenges with the implementation of this new system. It's now eight months. 
for Mr. J. Peter Toy from Langeberg in the Western Cape. That means another month of unpaid debit orders, not paying his funeral policy for him and his family on time. He is the one who is faced with two of his CWP colleagues sitting outside his house, begging for food for their children. He is the one that must take his loss and share it with his colleagues so that they don't go hungry. 12 years into this program, and we are still remodeling and reviewing. The purpose of the Community Works Program in municipalities is to create access to a minimum level of regular and predictable income from a work opportunity for those who need them through targeting areas with high levels of poverty and unemployment. Female participants in Kanaland, one of the poorest communities in the country, shared stories of how they have to use their own tools, carrying spades from their home with them daily because there is just no supply of tools and material. Yet, the implementing agents, mostly non-profit organizations, appointed by this department to facilitate this program, receive millions. And upon researching these NGOs, it makes for very interesting reading. The people who do the actual work still remain poor and unemployed. Minister, you have a choice. You can decide to keep on throwing money at a program that is not working for the people on the ground, or you can incorporate the community works program into local municipalities. In principle, the DA supports a review of the CWP program to ensure that CWP workers, not third parties or implementing organizations are the beneficiaries of this program. To this end, the DA proposes that the Department of COCTA stops administering the CWP budget as this does not form part of its core function. Instead, the CWP budget should be allocated to the municipalities administered public works programs with the caveat that they provide quarterly reports on program implementation. Using municipalities will cut out on the fees paid to implementing agents and save the taxpayer millions of rands. This will result in huge cut cost cutting and a better chance of participants being taken up in jobs, either in municipalities or in the private sector. This minister is a real return on investment and if done properly, can improve service delivery in so many of the dysfunctional municipalities across the country. Minister, I beg you, on behalf of the thousands of underemployed people, to consider these recommendations and many others for what they are and not who it is coming from. I thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Spies. The next speaker will be Honorable Nsimang from the ANC. I'm informed, Honorable Members, that the Honorable Tasa left two minutes, which we would want to give to Honorable Nsimang. Honorable Nsimang, you have 10 minutes. Thank you, Honorable uh, House Chair, Honorable Minister, Honorable Deputy Ministers, Honorable Members. The ANC remains committed to the vision of an ethical, capable, and developmental state as articulated in the National Development Plan, described as a state with capacity to mobilize both market and non-market stakeholders in order to champion a developmental agenda which is aimed at resolving the triple challenges of poverty, unemployment, and inequality. The developmental state has a responsibility to deliver services to the poor and marginalized communities in order to act as a catalyst for development. This requires a fundamental transformation and redesign of this sphere of government so that it is adequately equipped to fulfill this developmental mandate within the paradigm of democratic inclusive growth and development. 
it is it is also alluded to the uh, legislative and uh, institutional framework needed to give effect to this vision. Our task is to bring new capacities, attitudes, and approaches which strengthens relations between the municipal councils and administrators, between management and the workforce, between municipalities and uh, service users, and all other relevant actors at local uh, government. Last year, ahead of uh, 2021 local government elections, cabinet released a state of local government report, which was very explicit about the challenges facing local government. Amongst uh, these challenges that were raised by the report is the political administrative interference, financial uh, management, governance, and service delivery challenges. The, the, the report revealed that 166 municipalities were experiencing one or more of these challenges. Out of those, 64 had reached a state of dysfunctionality and service delivery had collapsed in those municipalities. And that are currently under section 139, subsection uh, 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 7 intervention. The ANC is of the view that the bigger chunk of the budget that is before us should be directed to respond to these challenges facing local government and should be allocated to programs that are meant to turn around the situation, mainly in the dysfunctional municipalities. The municipal support and intervention plans that have been developed uh, together with SALGA to assist each of the 64 dysfunctional municipalities be implemented to turn around and help to restore functionality and deliver municipal services. We are still convinced that the promulgation of the intergovernmental monitoring support and intervention bill will go a long way in addressing some of the challenges, especially putting in place early warning systems to prevent collapse in municipalities. Honorable members, various reports of the Auditor General have highlighted challenges with regards to the finance, performance management, lack of human resource capacity, and deepening culture of impunity at local government, which breeds lack of accountability and consequence management. The 2018-2019 report, which was titled open code, not much to go around, yet not the right hands at the till, close code, sharply raised the challenges around uh, human resources to manage municipalities and highlighted challenges emanating from the political and administrative uh, in interference. Also in the 2019-2020 uh, report titled Open Code, ethical and accountable leadership should drive the required change close code, carried a special report on the financial management of local government uh, of local government's COVID-19 initiatives. This report reflected the same trends that were observed in the main report, and it also revealed that compromised control environment and poor financial man uh, performance management were exposed during COVID-19 pandemic. We also uh, welcome that in the medium-term budget, the allocation towards SALGA will increase from 808 million rands in the year 2022-2023 to 882 million rands in the year 2024-2025. This move is a significant uh, is, is is significant to us uh, because the association plays a pivotal role in coordinating of uh, in, in coordination of local government and is a key stakeholder of development in our municipalities. Honorable members, it is important that we make people of South Africa aware that the DA governed Western Cape is fundamentally opposed to the district development model, which is meant to coordinate and streamline development in municipalities. We are not surprised by the actions of the DA in the Western Cape. The DA opposes anything that has a chance of reversing the apartheid legacy, such as the racial skewed special development. They have no interest in streamlining and coordinating uh, development in the white suburb of uh, Cape Town and townships such as Kailija, Kualanga, and Mitchell's Plain and other um, townships in the province. This budget is true to the character of the ANC of being biased to the poor, and the working class uh, communities. The NC supports the budget uh, vote three. The NC leaves, the NC leads. I thank you, Chairperson. 
Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Msimango. I'm informed that this was your maiden speech. Thank you very much. I will now call the Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs to close the debate. The Honorable the Minister. Honorable Minister. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much to all the members of the uh, Portfolio Committee who have participated in this debate. Uh, let me first say that uh, it is also, it is disingenuous of some of the members to talk as though we should run the municipalities because they know that, first of all, we have no constitutional mandate to run the municipalities. And secondly, we don't have the capacity to run the municipalities. So to come and speak here as though we, we should actually run the municipalities is disingenuous. Uh, let me also say that and this department, even though it gets 110, 111 plus billion, after we've transferred all the grants and taken out the CWP money, all we're left with is less than a billion, which covers MISA as well. So we are a very small department one of the smallest in government. So I, I just thought I should make that point. But let me also say that the division of revenue is, in my view, not correct. Because local government gets the least out of the division of revenue. But this is because a wrong assumption was made that municipalities will be able to raise their own resources, which is incorrect. Municipalities, the majority of municipalities are not able to raise their, their, to raise their own revenue. They don't have a revenue base. They serve indigent citizens. So that assumption was incorrect in the first place. And of course, We've been pleading that that, that should change, but um, it hasn't changed yet. So that's where we are. The lots of the small municipalities cannot even afford to hire engineers. That's why MISA has to as assist them with the few engineers that MISA has, because they cannot afford to hire engineers. One of the speakers said, why, why aren't the municipalities hiring their own uh, engineers? So the reason is they can't afford it. And sometimes they hire unregistered engineers, which is not satisfactory. You need a, a registered engineer to plan, to sign off their plans and so on. So let me also I thank the, or let me say to the NFP, yes, uh, I think I will discuss with Treasury, but that responsibility of contracts and transactions in local government is really under the MFP, MFPA, the municipal financial, and, and it's not under directly under us. So it's Treasury that sees the transactions. But we'll discuss with the minister and take your suggestion to say that, uh, and I think it would be a good idea actually to have all the contracts published. And not only who got the contract, how much it cost, how long it's going to take, so that people can monitor whether the, the funds are being used correctly and also whether the original contract uh, and the, the amount in the original contract is what ends up being paid and there's no escalation. So I, I will discuss with the minister, but it's not something that resides directly under us. 
And I agree with the, the honorable uh, Sheikh that it would be desirable not to have um, part of the council members uh, being involved in appointing managers in the municipality. But at the moment, that's where we are. We must. We are just trying to make sure that the criteria is correct, that people are appointed according to the prescripts and the qualifications. And I also completely agree with the other members, and I thank the members of the ANC the, and the IFP and the NFP for supporting uh, the, this debate, the, this uh, budget. Uh, it's always... Uh, thank, you. thank you so much, uh, Honorable Minister. I even gave you 30 seconds. Thank you very much. 30 seconds. Thank you very much for your generosity. Thank you. Honorable members, that concludes the debate and the business of this virtual mini plenary session. The mini plenary will now rise. Thank, Thank you. you, Mika. You are the best. Long live.